Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. This is Alexis and the host here today welcoming you in to the show. Thanks for joining us on our little what if John, our alternate history John in history today. Uh, for today's topic, I'm not really going to tell you what we're going to talk about before the break. I'm going to kind of leave you in some, some suspense a little bit, but I, I will give you a couple clues. A few weeks ago on the podcast, John and I uh, talked about kind of a topic. Uh, and in that episode, we talked about several different people um, throughout that episode and related to that specific topic, but we didn't really focus on just one specific person. So today, we're going to go back to that topic, but we're only going to really be talking about one of the people that we mentioned in that specific episode. Uh, if you listened to that episode a couple weeks ago, again, I'm not going to uh, reveal the theme uh, because I feel that would give give some things away. But if you listen to that episode and you know who was in that episode, you can probably guess who I'm going to be talking about today because it's me in the host chair. Uh, but I do hope that we delve into this person and shed a little bit hopefully a lot of light on this person and, and have a little bit more depth to the discussion around that specific person. So again, not going to give too much away before our break. Hope you stick around, but uh, do hope you join us after the break to talk about um, this one specific person in history and that, how things would have gone differently if she had been allowed to do something that she wasn't. So join us after the break. Would groceries delivered to you in as fast as one hour save you a trip to the store? Instacart makes that possible thanks to personal shoppers in your area who hand-select items based on your preferences from the stores you love. And shopping multiple stores is possible on a single order. Instacart picks the freshest produce and even keeps your eggs safe, all while finding everything you usually buy, providing smart suggestions for new items, and even highlighting deals to help you save money. And now you get free delivery on your first order over $35. Let Instacart know we sent you and help support our show by following the link in the show notes. Instacart. Groceries delivered in as fast as one hour. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. It is Alexis in the host chair today. I'm flying solo, driving the what if machine solo today, but that's okay. Uh, glad you joined me on our little jaunt through history. Um, as I alluded to before the break, so I'll actually, you know, spill the beans now. A few weeks ago on the podcast, we talked about primogeniture. Uh, if you listen to that podcast, you don't need that much of a refresher. I strongly suggest you haven't listened to that episode to go back in the archive and listen to it. But just for a little, little briefer, um, in case you haven't, primogeniture is basically the practice of males in a line of succession becoming the next ruler, and that has no uh, dependence on how many females are in the certain line of succession and the birth order of those females. So, for example, um, if you have a king who has maybe five children and the first four are girls and then he finally has a son, under primogeniture, the son immediately jumps ahead of his four older sisters and becomes the heir to the throne under the system. So it's the only way you really get to a female on a throne is if there are no um, males in that line of succession. So that is primogeniture in a nutshell. Uh, if you listened to that episode a few weeks ago, we mentioned specifically in England uh, that that is not the 
system in place anymore. It was um, kind of overturned, so to speak, in 2013. But um, it was the practice previous to that. So we mentioned in uh, 2013, we have, of course, Prince George of Cambridge. Uh, but his younger sister, Charlotte, who was born in 2015, is not superseded by her younger brother, Louis, who was born in 2018. Um, because we've kind of gotten rid of primogeniture, there's no boys skipping girls in the lines of succession. They hold their place. Also, because when we got rid of primogeniture, we didn't know that George was going to be a girl or a boy. Uh, his mother was still pregnant. Um, so if Charlotte had been born first, and then George, and then Louis, Charlotte would have held her place as well. It's important to remember that. Um, if Charlotte had been born first, she would have um, been the heir to the throne, regardless of how many brothers came after her. Um, but what is important in our current timeline is Charlotte holds her place. She is not superseded by her younger brother. Um, so that's just kind of primogeniture in a nutshell. So now we're going to get into the person we're actually going to be talking about today. As you can probably tell by my example, and if you've listened to the podcast for a while, you probably know where we're going. We are going back to England. I mentioned in that episode, uh, Margaret Tudor. Uh, she is the daughter of Henry the Seventh of England. Uh, she's the second child. Of course, we've talked about her older brother, Arthur, many times on the show before. Uh, we've also talked about her younger brother, Henry, who becomes Henry the Eighth. But the only reason we have a Henry VIII is we have this system called primogeniture because in between Arthur and Henry VIII, we've got a Margaret Tudor. She is the second child of Henry VII and his wife, Elizabeth of York. Um, so if we don't have primogeniture in place, Arthur dies, let's assume, in this alternate timeline that we are going to create, um, he still dies without heirs. So we have to move to the next person in the line of succession. We don't have primogeniture now, so the next person up is his younger sister, Margaret. We don't have to jump to his younger brother, uh, who would become Henry VIII. So let's kind of jump in and how I'm kind of going to do it today, because I feel like it's kind of the way I did my research and it's kind of the way um, that things just kind of flowed. is kind of marrying the what did with the what if. I'll try and keep things distinct and separate and clear as much as possible in terms of what actually is the what did and what is the what if, uh, but just kind of talking it out as we go kind of through the timeline instead of kind of doing the what did and then doing the complete backtrack and doing the what if uh, is how I'm going to kind of tackle it today. But again, I'll try and keep it as clear as possible, as understandable as possible as we walk through it. So in this timeline, uh, we have Henry VII, he dies in 1509. Uh, his, uh, first son, Arthur, has predeceased him, dying in 1502, so now we have Margaret Tudor. She is coming to the throne in 1509. In the real timeline, she does get married before her, her father, uh, dies. However, in this timeline, I don't see her doing that. Um, I kind of just see her kind of coming to the throne, galvanizing her power, and then, you know, picking her husband. Again, because if we don't have this uh, system of primogeniture in place, it's kind of always assumed she is the second child, so it's kind of assumed if anything happens to Arthur, uh, she will become the heir. So I think it kind of would have been like, let's keep our options open in case something happens to Arthur. Arthur let's keep our options open a little bit because Margaret will become the queen. Um, so let's not tie her down to anybody um, until she succeeds to the throne. So she comes to the throne. She is Queen Margaret in 1509. So first kind of question is she's an unmarried queen. Um, because even though we don't have this system of primogeniture, we still need some heirs. We still need to further the bloodline. Uh, so we got to get her married. So where are her marriage options? I don't see her marrying an English person, uh, per se, simply because if she married a duke, an earl, you know, some, some person in the nobility, I think that would have led to a lot of infighting, a lot of um, backstabbing and a lot of kind of power plays and maneuvers, uh, within the court. So I think she is, was smart not 
not to do that. Um, so I don't see her marrying an English person. Also, um, because we, her father, Henry the Seventh, wins the throne in battle at the Battle of Bosworth, there are legitimate um, successors to that former bloodline. I mean, her mother was the daughter of Edward the Edward the Fourth, uh, kind of married Edward, Henry the Seventh to kind of merge the bloodlines. So. It, I just don't see her marrying an English person, Englishman, as being a possibility. Don't really also seeing see her marrying um, a prince of France. Um, of course, at this point uh, in the real timeline, France is the age-old enemy of England, so I don't really see that happening as well. Um, there is a son in Spain, uh, but he dies too early. The The timelines don't match in terms of when she comes to the throne, her age, his age. They don't match in terms of getting them together and making a fruitful marriage and making a marriage that would produce heirs. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head when he passes away, but it's either very late 1400s or very early 1500s, possibly even before 1509, if I'm remembering the timeline correctly, so that's obviously not a possibility. It's also true of Portugal. There's not really any matches that match up in her specific timeline. There, there are some that are close, but not quite, not quite aligning up exactly how it should. Believe me, I tried to not have this match um, to the real timeline. I searched all over Europe, y'all. That was that was a little Texanism, Texanism there, but believe me, I tried. I searched all over Europe to find another alternate spouse for her. Couldn't find one in England. Couldn't find one in Spain. Couldn't find one in Portugal. Found one other option that would have been Frederick of Denmark. Don't really see that as a possibility for two reasons. One, um, again, the timeline's a, a little bit off. Not not quite. It, it's closer. It's definitely the cl kind of the closest in terms of the timeline, in terms of her age, his age, variable age, um, those kind of things. However, it it kind of feels like Denmark is kind of insular at this point. We don't really see Denmark going outward as much, and when we do see them going outward, they're going more towards Prussia, more towards that area, but not really going over to France or Spain or Portugal or England, so it just kind of didn't jibe in my head, so Frederick of Denmark didn't really make sense, and then there were two younger sons of James the Third of Scotland. I think that with this kind of thing, and I think we kind of see this in the real timeline with Mary Tudor, Mary the First, she marries a king of another country, and she is queen in her own right. So there's kind of this tension of power plays and politics involved, where they're both loyal to their own countries. So I was really trying to figure out who she could marry that wasn't going to be a king in his own right, because I think that gets a little bit complicated. Problem with that. There are two younger sons of, so James the Third up in Scotland, he's got, who will become James the Fourth. we'll get into him in a second, and then he's got two younger sons, but again, a problem, they die way too young, like, in their childhood, like, less than 10, uh, they're passing away. So they're obviously not options in the real timeline. And again, it's very early 1500s before Mar Margaret even comes to the throne. So those aren't a possibility. So again, I looked all over Europe, but I think ultimately she ends up still marrying James IV of Scotland like she does in the real timeline. So I thought this was interesting um, because it, it moves some things up, it changes some dynamics, it changes some bloodlines and some succession things that we'll get into in a little bit. Um, and it this is going to be one of those topics that we get into a lot where it's not going to look like a lot of stuff has changed, but I think in the overarching scheme of things, things will have changed. So let's get into that a little bit. So again, Margaret Tudor, she has come to the throne in 1509. 
And soon after that, she marries James the Fourth of Scotland. There is an age difference between the two. He is about I I didn't do the math, but he is at least a decade, I want to say, older than her. Um, but that's not completely out of the realm of possibility. Um, what's interesting is his mother is actually from Denmark. It's Margaret of Denmark. Um, so they've kind of had some alliances. Scotland and Denmark have kind of had some alliances recently. Um, and I think that's another reason why Margaret herself wouldn't have married um, anybody from Denmark. I think she kind of would have seen marrying James the Fourth as almost kind of killing two birds with one stone. She was aligning herself with Scotland. Um, she's also aligning herself with Denmark because we have this connection between Mar through Margaret of Denmark, James's mother, um, who was actually, from my research, very well liked in Scotland. She she accomplished a lot. So I, I think that's kind of how Mag Margaret would have gotten her alliance to that part of the world um, is marrying James the Fourth of Scotland. This interesting quote that I found from Henry the Seventh, you know, when Margaret does marry James the Fourth in the real timeline, much like in our alternate timeline, um, there was these kind of rumblings in the court, like, are, are we sure this is okay? I mean, we don't, we're not sure. And Henry the Seventh was actually known to say, "What then? Should any, should anything of the kind happen?" happen and God avert the omen, I foresee that our realm would suffer no harm, since England would not be absorbed by Scotland, but rather Scotland by England, being the noblest head of the entire island, since there's always less glory and honor, and being joined to that which is far the greater, just as Normandy once came under the rule and power of our ancestors, the English. This quote kind of made me laugh. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, when I first read this, because this is Kind of eventually what does happen in the real timeline, because we have to do that cousin jump in the real timeline with James VI of Scotland, who becomes James I of England after Elizabeth I dies with no heirs. Um, and it, it kind of, as you go through the history and through the timeline, even to the present day, I mean, not that long ago, we had Scotland trying to have a referendum to break away from England. It, I think there kind of was this... Um, Sub sublimation of Scotland into England. It just happened differently um, than what Henry the Seventh is talking about. Even though this marriage does happen, Margaret does marry uh, James the Fourth. Um, this does kind of happen later with their descendants. Um, so I just thought it was an intriguing quote to think about, um, where it was talking about being subsumed. Scotland being subsumed under England, because that kind of just happened, but not with this marriage. So, I think exactly the opposite happens um, in this alternate timeline that we're creating. If Margaret, who is Queen of England, is marrying James, the King of Scotland, obviously they become monarchs of their respective countries, so Margaret becomes Queen of Scotland, James becomes King of England, but they are distantly related. They're I believe, cousins through a distant uh, relative and ancestor. Um, they're on the same island. So I see this actually galvanizing into a marriage of equals. Um, this kind of, the, the union of the crowns, the union of the thrones, the union of the countries. I think there's this kind of, both in... History. I mean, James the Fourth was known as a very astute political leader. He was he did good things for his country. Um, Margaret was also um, seen as a very strong uh, political leader. She actually, in the real timeline, becomes the regent for her son, who becomes James the Fifth of Scotland, uh, when her husband actually, in the real timeline, passes away. Uh, and James V becomes king at one years old. Um, so Margaret actually does some things very, very well in terms of diplomacy. So they both kind of have that in them. So I think if Margaret and James marry, become king and queen of those respective countries, join those countries together, I think you would have seen this galvanization and Great Britain would have become Great Britain 
I mean, two centuries prior than when it actually becomes Great Britain in the 1700s. Might not have been called Great Britain, but I think the the sentiment of Great Britain definitely would have existed, and I think it would have moved that timeline along quicker. And again, I think you wouldn't see, even to the present day, this kind of, I hate to use the term infighting, but um, this kind of tension that exists between England and Scotland, I think there would have been this kind of more amalgamation, more gradual melding of the cultures of the, um, of, of just the countries. I mean, so many things wouldn't have happened. You wouldn't have had Jacobite rebellion later. You wouldn't have, well, maybe you would have, depending on if we jump from Catholic to Protestant back to Catholic, but I don't think you need to do that. We don't have a Henry VIII. We don't have this need for a, a male heir that keeps happening. Um, so I think they're, they're kind of just when the, would have been this steady, steady progression of England and Scotland together into this, I don't want to say it's not stable today, but this very stable country because they don't have this kind of tumultuous backstory and history I have you've I'm a fan of John Oliver and I completely understand if he's not to everybody's taste he he can be a little bit uh crass or abrasive uh sometimes but he actually did a piece on um Scottish independence when they were doing their referendum and what they still do to this day is they still have mock battles between the English and the Scots for certain things and he, you know, makes a comment, he's like, we're still role-playing with wooden swords to, you know, emotionally work through this this relationship that we've been in, this kind of uneasy marriage that we've been in after we were kind of forced to be together because we had to do that cousin jump. So we don't have to do that cousin jump, we kind of have this gradual melding, which I think is a little more peaceful, a little more progressive, not as jarring, not as jolting, a little smoother. And that continues up to the present day. Of course, in the real timeline, we have James IV dying in 1513 at the Battle of Flodden. V becomes James V, and in 1513, at the age of one, he's born in 1512. That doesn't happen in this timeline. It doesn't need to. The Battle of Flodden was fought with England <laughs> in retaliation for Scotland supporting France. Of course, we've talked about this on the show before. Scotland and France are allies. We'll get into this in a little bit. Uh, Scot Scotland and France are allies, so Scotland, um, so England invades France. Scotland comes to the aid of France, and in retaliation, England attacks Scotland at the Battle of Flodden, and James IV is killed in the real timeline. That doesn't need to happen in this timeline, because we, again, Margaret's gonna, not gonna attack her own husband's country, especially when she's queen, also of that country. So we don't have James the Fourth dying, we don't have James V coming to the throne at the age of one. He'd actually become king of Scotland in 1488, so he'd been king of Scotland for quite a long time uh, before Margaret comes to the throne of England. I mentioned there was that age, age gap. So, um, there is that, but James doesn't have to, we actually did an episode on the Battle of Flodden. I'm not remembering the, um, episode number. It's, it was very early in the archive, guys, but I know the title was Not Fallen at Flodden. So we actually have talked about that battle before, if you want to go back and check out that episode as well. But yeah, he doesn't have to do that in, um, in this timeline that we're creating. So my next question was, okay, he doesn't die in 1513. When does he die? Because in 1513, he's not old, but he's not necessarily young either. He was born in 1573. I'm not remembering off the top of my head when Margaret was born to do that math, but I know he was born in 1573, dies in 1513. So he's not young when he passes away, but he's not old either. Um, So I was trying to figure out when he dies. And the date that I landed on is 1415. Again, he's, he's in like middle age, which is a understood time to die in this timeline. 
The other reason why I landed on 1415 is in 1415 in April, I believe it is, his second child with Margaret is born, a son named Alexander. Um, now, that son does not live very long, um, but I think you would have seen that we have the heir, James, who will become James V. We have our second child, Alexander, so we're good. Um, there were some children in between. Uh, James and Alexander, but they died as infants or were stillborn. So James, uh, Alexander is born in 1415, but doesn't live very long, but I, but past 1415. So I, for some reason, I see James the fourth dying in 1415, um, predeceasing his son, Alexander. The reason I see this is because I think, I don't see Margaret marrying again. I think it's kind of that same issue I was struggling with, with before of trying to find another husband for her. Now, of course, in the real timeline, she does marry some questionable choices that we will get into in a minute. Um, but I just don't see her as queen. I don't see her kowtowing her power to somebody else, especially when she's got an heir. So once her husband dies, I see her, um, you know, living by herself as a widow. I think there possibly is a situation of kind of James V becomes King of Scotland, and I'm using King of Scotland in air quotes, so you can't see me, but it's almost like that you're King of Scotland and you'll be King, you'll be king of England when, when I die, um, but right now I'll kind of hold it as a regency for you. Again, she does hold a re regency for Jan the real James V uh, in the real timeline, so I think in this alternate timeline, you know, James the Fourth dies in 15, 1415, you know, and I think there's kind of this understood, like, yeah, you're king of Scotland, but I'm, I'm gonna pull the puppet strings for a little bit longer until you get a little bit older um and then he'll become king of scotland king of england on her uh on her death whenever that takes place i mentioned that she has some very questionable marriages in the real timeline uh her second husband is a man named archibald douglas uh, he's, the, he's the Earl of Angus. Now, in the real timeline, she um, cancels herself out. She negates her ability to be regent by marrying this man. She is only allowed to be regent if she remains a widow, um, if she does not marry. So as soon as she marries Archibald Douglas, it's like, well, can't be regent anymore. She has to give that up. Um, what's interesting about this is through Archibald Douglas, she has a daughter, Margaret Douglas, who becomes the mother of Henry Stewart, Lord Darnley. If you've heard that name before, you should have heard that name before. It's an important name in Scottish and English history because he becomes the husband of Mary, Queen of Scots, and the father of James VI in the real timeline. So, if we have no need to marry Archibald Douglas, because as I mentioned, I don't see her getting married after for her first husband, James IV, dies as queen, as Queen Margaret. We don't have Margaret Douglas. We don't have Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley. We are eventually going to get to a Mary Queen of Scots. We'll talk about that in a minute. So, who in the heck does she marry? Because we don't have Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley, as a person. He does not exist. There was no need for him to exist. It's just an interesting little twist there that that timeline and that bloodline does not exist because it doesn't need to because she doesn't have a second husband. In the real timeline, she also has a third husband after uh, Archibald Douglas, but there's not really anything of consequence that comes out of that marriage. But there's no need for Archibald Douglas. There's no need for Margaret Douglas. There's no need for Henry Stewart or Lord Darnley, even though there will also be a Mary Queen of Scots here in a little bit. So let's talk a little bit now. What does this united country look like? I mentioned that both Margaret and James the Fourth do have a lot of diplomacy and do have a lot of skills in terms of country ruling and country management. So 
it'd be interesting to know now we have this united I'm going to call it Great Britain, for lack of a better word, it might not be what it's actually called, um, but this United England and Scotland and Great Britain, how do they run that country? Um, because as I mentioned, they do have some skills in that area. I think you would have kind of seen this, you know, kind of that rise of the court progress that we don't really see until Elizabeth I in the royal timeline, which is the late 1500s, early 1600s, um... But I think you kind of would have seen this kind of moving around to different parts of their kingdom. And it would have included places in England, places in Scotland. Or you would have seen, and that could have been together. I think they would have gone different places together. But it also could have been, you know, I'm going to be up here for a little bit and you're going to be down here for a little bit. We're going to communicate, but we're ruling jointly just in separate places. I think both of those are possibilities uh, that could happen. I think that, but I, I, for some reason, I do see that kind of courtly progress, kind of we're going to, we're going to go around our realm and check out what our realm is doing. Um, I think you would have seen the rise of that a little bit sooner and a little bit quicker. And I think you would have seen it more going to, you saw this a little bit with him, with Henry VIII in the royal timeline, not just going to the different palaces, going to their lords, going to a little bit more of where the people were. It wasn't just... Because in, in history, previous to this, we've kind of seen the court move, but they really only go from palace to palace to palace to palace to palace. They don't really stop in the cities and and engage with the people. And I don't see... I don't think when I say people, again, I'm kind of using air quotes there, I don't think they would have been engaging with the the wool merchant or the cloth merchant or, or those kind of people, but definitely would have been engaging with the sheriffs in a town, the, the magistrates, the earls, the dukes, more of those people, and it would have been more of a, I'm going to come to you, I'm not going to expect that you come to where I am at my court all the time. It would have been, kind of seen that more, and kind of using that as a way to check in on the country, make sure everything was running smoothly, make sure everything was being handled like it needed to be. Um, I think you also would have seen an alliance with France. I think in this instance, it would have been friend of my friend is my friend. Um, of course, in the real timeline, we have the Auld Alliance, Scotland and France are friends. Now we have England and Scotland joining together. So I think you would have seen, by extension, England aligning with France. Um, you can kind of see this in... Margaret in the real timeline when she's up in Scotland she does kind of do a lot to foment and cement that relationship um and she kind of understood and James did too as well kind of understood the benefit of everybody kind of getting along as kind of cliche and simple as that sounds kind of understood hey let's all be friends um, that does backfire in the real timeline with the Battle of Loddon and the fight with England. But I think you would have seen that alliance with France, with England a lot faster, and kind of this, I don't want to say one big happy family, but kind of a one big happy family scenario. Um, so I see, again, you know, James V has died in 1515. Uh, so I can see... Margaret may be living into the 1520s, um, and so James the Fifth would become um, King of England as well as King of Scotland. Um, now we gotta get married. We gotta continue that bloodline. So who does he marry? I think he he marries again. Like I just mentioned, we've already got that alliance with France. In the real timeline: he marries first uh, Madeleine of, of Valois, but then he marries Marie de Guise. Um, I, I still see that happening. Um, I, I mean, at this point, we're all aligned, France, Scotland, England. So I still see that happening. So of course we get a Mary Queen of Scots, eventually James V and his second wife, uh, Marie de Guise, 
uh, have a daughter, Mary, who becomes Mary Queen of Scots. Again, even if they had sons, which they don't in the royal timeline, but even if they did, we don't have to worry about that. We're not under the system of primogeniture right now. Um, so who does Mary marry? Now, she is married to Francis II in the royal timeline, Francis II of France, but he is sickly. He dies young. She's got to come over um, and marry uh, somebody else. Also, I don't see her marrying Francis II in the real time, in this timeline, in our alternate timeline, simply because it's kind of that issue of marrying an heir to a throne when you are an heir to a throne. It's It, it gets into that tenuous situation. Um, again, I, I tried to find another another spouse for Margaret and I just couldn't uh but I also think that marrying someone who's literally on your same island does make some sense um a little bit more than marrying someone who's literally an ocean or body of water or a very very long land road away uh I think it made sense so I know in the real timeline that there were some alliances with Portugal um, for Mary Queen of Scots, so I could see that, because again, because we don't have to have this jump with religion as well, because that was another thing I was battling in my head, like, oh, I gotta stick to Catholicism instead of kind of jumping to Protestants. I think, now, of course, in the real timeline, um, Scotland eventually becomes kind of Presbyterian, uh, which is, uh, Protestant. I was grasping for that word. Um, so I, but I think there would have been this very gradual, much like that, that shift with kind of this, the steady move of England and Scotland together. I think you would have seen more of a gradual shift and change in, um, religious situations. So I think at this point, we kind of got to stick to Catholic rulers, so we can't kind of really go over to Germany, the Netherlands, that kind of area for our spouses yet, because they are very much in the Protestant realm, and we haven't quite got there, I think, in this timeline. I think we're still kind of rooted, rooted firmly Catholic, because we haven't really had the chance to, we haven't really had the need to suddenly decide that we don't uh, align with the Pope anymore, uh, we don't have Henry VIII having to divorce all these wives, um, so I think that you still would have had Catholic as the main force, main religious force, so I, I think you still have to stick with some Catholic, um, spouses, so I think that kind of limits your scope a little bit to Spain, Portugal, France, at this point England, Scotland, also with England and Scotland, it, you know, somebody might be saying, like, like, well, you know, Scotland kind of became Protestant on its own a little bit, uh, with outside influence, but, but kind of a little more insular, um, but I think, again, if you have this very, um, unified England and Scotland, and also that very tight connection with France, I mean, part of the reason that that power vacuum is allowed to exist in France is because Mary Queen of Scots has to be sent to France to get away to bring her safe. So she's over in France for quite a long time, technically as quote unquote queen, but not ruling her country. Her mother is ruling for her in this real timeline. We don't have to do all of that. So I think because Mary Queen of Scots in the Royal Timeline is away in France, it kind of can breed this dissent and this this infighting and this, you know, this religious change. But if we don't have to have all those things happening, there's this very stable, very gradual I think I think we stay Catholic for a little bit longer and it's a little more organic, a little more slow, and a little more just natural to kind of shift and it's not as stark of you know you're suddenly my enemy now because you don't believe the way I do I think there's the I think there's a little bit more of a peaceful coexistence that that kind of flourishes out of this 
um, this time in history if we have Margaret Tudor, Queen Margaret, sitting on the throne of England, and she marries James IV of Scotland, so they become joint rulers and form Great Britain in 1509. So it's just an interesting thing to think about. Again, it's not that much of a departure. You know, some people that, again, are kind of the stalwarts of English history don't exist. Henry Stewart, Lord Darnley, doesn't exist. Um, so it's just an interesting thing to think about. But I definitely think this situation would have produced, again, and I don't want to say the country is not stable. It's stable. But a much stabler Great Britain moving through history. We don't have to have kind of the upheavals that we know uh, in history. It's just an interesting thing to think about all because when Henry the Seventh died, even though he had had a son that had predeceased him, he had a daughter ready and waiting. She was his second child that could come in, take the throne, and nobody batted an eye. Nobody thought it was weird. Nobody thought it was strange. It was totally fine um to have a queen in her own right sitting on the throne of England as a child of an anointed king. So it's just an interesting thing to think about. I hope you enjoyed uh, this topic today. Uh, if you have different thoughts, we'd love to hear about it. We have our website, which is our forum. Uh, that is a forkintimepodcast.com. We also post all of the um, episodes on our social media, so you can interact with the posts there. And we do respond to those if you decide to interact with them. Um, so we'd love to have you join our community there as well. If you are so inclined, you can become a patron of the podcast. Uh, that would be great as well. There are some minimal costs involved. Um, one thing that I'm super excited about, because it actually came in the mail a couple days ago, we have merchandise here at A Fork in Time. So if you go to the show notes, uh, we'll put that in there. We have partnered with Teespring. Uh, so you can go to that link and you can get anything with our, pretty much anything with our logo on it that your hearts desire. T-shirts, cell phone cases. I personally have a travel coffee mug that I used on Thursday to get to work because I had to leave at 6 a.m. Um, so coffee is a big ding for me and I was very excited to be able to use my fork in time coffee mug on the way to work with my coffee. So if you'd like to get some merchandise, we'd love to uh, have that as well. It's also a great way to spread the word about the podcast. If somebody sees you wearing your t-shirt, sipping from a coffee mug, might ask a question of, hey, what's, what's, what's a fork in time? What's that about? So that's really exciting as well. Also want to remind you, we recorded our room number three last night, so look out for that in your feeds if you are familiar with the room where it happened. Of course, here on Forked in Time, we do alternate history. That's what we do here. But if you're interested more in the what dids instead of the what ifs, we got a podcast for that too. It is the room where it happened. As I said, we just recorded room number three. We're already getting ready for room number four. Uh, that actually... Re uh, releases on a monthly basis as opposed to a fork in time that tries to release on a weekly basis. Uh, so if you're interested in that, check that out. You can get it the same place. You get a fork in time in any podcast uh, catcher of your choice. You can also go to the website, a fork in time podcast.com. We haven't split the, the websites out yet, so you can get all the information for a room where it, the room where it happens from a fork in time podcast.com as well. Uh, you can also join uh us in the process of making uh, a fork in time or the room where it happened. Uh, we'd love to have anybody as far as topic suggestions. Um, if you'd even like to be, have your voice heard on the podcast, we had a lot of our familiar characters last night, but we'd love to have some new voices too. That's great. So if you'd like to have your voice heard on a particular topic, let us know. If you're into production, we'd love to know that as well. So we'd love to, love to have you join our little community here at A Fork in Time and the room where it happened. So I'm going to stop talking. I want to thank you once again for joining me on this little jaunt through history. And as always, our reminder that if you fork in, time, fork in the road and fork in time, our suggestion is, of course, that you take it.
Have a good day, everyone. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more and provide feedback by visiting our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Connect to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash a fork in time or follow us on Twitter at A-F-I-T podcast. If you want to support the show financially, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash a fork in time. We hope you will join us next time.